to ensure the vitamin D level is above 30 before we can confidently say that vitamin D is not uh, responsible for it. Now, the presentation and natural history of normal calcemic primary hyperparathyroidism is quite variable. So a study coming out of Columbia, they uh, reported that about 57% of these people had osteoporosis in at least one site at baseline, and suggesting that this is not a, necessarily a benign condition. About 19% of these people developed hypercalcemia over a three-year follow-up, with people who were older and had higher baseline calcium excretion more likely to become hypercalcemic, and 41% of them developed evidence of progressive parathyroid disease. So when you compare the biochemical profile of normal calcemic primary hyperparathyroidism and FHH to the other forms of para, uh, to the forms of hyperparathyroidism we discussed, you see in normal calcemic primary hyperpara, by definition, calcium is normal, PTH is increased, phosphate is normal, and usually the urinary calcium excretion is less than 315 milligrams in 24 hours. And FHH, as I mentioned, is, is virtually identical to the presentation of primary hyperparathyroidism, with the exception maybe that the phosphate levels are usually uniformly normal, but most importantly that the fractional excretion of calcium is typically less than 1%. So now what you guys are most interested in, to operate or not to operate. Now it's important to note that not everyone who has primary hyperparathyroidism needs surgery. So this study, also coming out of Columbia, followed 116 patients with primary hyperparathyroidism, 49% of whom did not undergo surgery. And what they found that of those uh, 57 patients, 22 of them had disease progression, and there was disease progression in uh, 18 of those were actually asymptomatic at presentation, but 31 of those actually had stable disease. And of those 31, all of them were actually asymptomatic at baseline, though some of them met surgical criteria at baseline and some of them did not. So having said that, how do you make a decision as to whether or not to operate on someone with primary hyperparathyroidism? They've either been referred to you by an endocrinologist who's done a thorough workup, or you've done the evaluation yourself, and you're convinced that this individual has primary hyperparathyroidism, whether classic or normal calcemic. And you now need to make the decision as to whether or not to offer them surgery. So if they're symptomatic, then the decision is, is reasonably straightforward. I should add the corollary that cardiovascular disease by itself is not an indication for surgical intervention. And the reason why it's not is that even though there are associations with cardiovascular outcomes, there is no evidence to suggest that these outcomes improve in patients who've had surgery. Similarly, whether or not the neuropsychological manifestations of uh, hyperparathyroidism are indications by themselves for surgery is debatable. But certainly what is not uh, controversial is this individual has symptomatic hypercalcemia. If they have symptomatic nephrolithiasis or fractures, you should offer them surgery. Where the challenge comes is in the asymptomatic patient. So the patient who has biochemical evidence of hyperparathyroidism, but is feeling well and has no discernible symptoms. And the fourth international workshop on the management of asymptomatic hyperparathyroidism has developed the following guidelines, which are useful. And really the guidelines suggest that surgery is indicated if there's a risk of progression or if there's evidence of subclinical end organ disease. So individuals who are less than the age of 50, so obviously younger, they will live longer with this, should be offered surgery. If the serum calcium is elevated above 0.25 millimoles above the upper limit of normal, those individuals should also be offered surgery. Individuals with impaired renal function, so a GFR less than 60, should be offered surgery. And individuals with an elevated 24-hour urinary calcium, so by elevated, I mean above 10 millimoles a day, should be offered surgery, really because of the risk of nephrolithiasis and possibly nephrocalcinosis. I mean, the, the guidelines strictly say there should be a biochemical analysis of stone risk, but in practice, that's probably less done. If an individual has nephrolithiasis or nephrocalcinosis on imaging, so these are people who are asymptomatic, but you should do a renal ultrasound, which is probably the, the, the least expensive uh, investigation. And if there is evidence of, nef of either of these conditions, they should be offered surgery. And additionally, all individuals should go I undergo ideally a uh, DEXA scan. So if there's uh, evidence of osteoporosis, so a T-score of less than 2.5 or a vertebral fracture on imaging, surgery should also be offered. 
Of course, there are other considerations in the decision whether or not to offer surgery. So first of all, there is patient preference. So surgery offers the only potential cure for primary hypoparathyroidism. So it's not unreasonable if a patient does not meet surgical criteria, but they are keen to, to have a, a definitive solution to offer them surgery. Of course, that also depends on the availability of surgical expertise. So if the expertise is not available, then you want to make, may want to reconsider whether or not surgery should be offered. And then I just want to highlight that surgery is not always feasible, even in patients who do have indications for surgery. And in those people, you want to make sure they avoid potential aggravating factors. So they should, for example, avoid dehydration, and they should make sure they have an adequate calcium intake of about 1,000 milligrams a day, but certainly not excessive. And individuals who have symptomatic or severe hypercalcemia or osteoporosis should be managed medically. And you should feel free to refer them to your friendly neighborhood endocrinologist for assistance with that. Thank you very much. Alicia, that was quite amazing. Thank you so much. I think the lecture was really um, exactly what a surgeon needs to know, not, not, not anything more. So uh, let's go to the polls. And Mark, will you manage the polls, please? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, can we get the first poll up, please? Okay. So, Mark, why don't I share my screen on that one? Super. I'll hand over to you, Mark. Right. So. We have a 45-year-old woman with no past medical history of note, presents with a calcium of 2.65 millimoles per liter, um, slightly above normal, parathyroid hormone of 65, uh, just about normal, high normal, and 25-hydroxy uh, vitamin D of 32. Her sister had a similar biochemical profile, which persisted after parathyroidectomy. So here's the question. Which of the following tests would be the most helpful in making a diagnosis? Estimated glomerular infiltration rates, bone densitometry, 24-hour urine calcium with fractional excretion of calcium, and a neck ultrasound. You'll be able to vote, vote in the meeting chat. Um, if you haven't opened it, it probably opened up already. And we'll keep that open for, uh, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 seconds until everyone is um, happy that we have a good representative number. I'm gonna let me say just to get it going. <laughs> Is it? I oh, can you come and talk to you? <laughs> Mark, just mute yourself. So far, it looks like there's an overwhelming uh, thought that uh, 24 urine calcium would be the correct answer. So shall we go to the next, shall we go to the next slide then? Super. Why don't All we right. think you? Right. So I agree with you and I'm thrilled everybody was listening so intently. So yes. So this is a patient who, who likely has uh, FHH or familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. And what the 24-hour urine calcium will give us information as to is how much calcium she's actually excreting. So if her fractional excretion of calcium is less than 1%, surely that's very strong evidence that this is indeed FHH. What is also a very important clue is her sister had a similar history. So remember, FHH is, is um, often runs in families. And the fact that her sister not only had a similar biochemical profile, but unfortunately, underwent a para an unnecessary parathyroidectomy with no improvement is also strong evidence that indeed this patient has FHH. Yeah. Next question. Mark? Lovely. Thank you. 
Um, question two, a 45-year-old woman with no past medical history of note presents with a calcium 2.75, parathyroid hormone of 65, and uh, vitamin D of 32. Which of the following would not assist you in deciding whether to operate? Presence of fatigue and bone pain, bone mineral density T-score of minus 3.1, asymptomatic renal calculi, and a negative system UV scan. Right, please go for it. All right, I've costed my vote. <laughs> maybe I can pose a question to you, Alicia, maybe to think about. Uh, we often hear about ionized versus the serum calcium. Do you find that something to think about and to, to use ever? Do you use that as a differentiating factor? Um, so usually when you get calcium from the lab, they usually adjust for the albumin levels. So obviously, you know, that that's where the crucial thing comes is in um, and I find that the when the results I get from the lab are usually well correlated between ionized and adjusted calcium. If something doesn't make sense to me, or if I have a doubt, so I had a patient recently who had had a parathyroidectomy and was now hypocalcemic, her parameters didn't look right. Then sometimes I will get an ionized calcium, but oftentimes I'm, I'm happy to just rely on the adjusted calcium, seeing that they, you know they seem to be quite closely related when I get results back from the lab. Super, thanks. All right, so I think we have 90% uh, of people saying a negative system EB scan would be the correct answer for that one. I'll be okay. interested to hear what your thoughts are. All right, so let's get back here. And I agree. So I think I saw some people chose presence of fatigue and bone pain. And I agree, you know, this is where, you know, it comes to the art of medicine and not always the science. Because some of these symptoms of, of hypercalcemia can be very, very nonspecific. It gets becomes even trickier when you have a patient who is has normal calcemic hyperparathyroidism. But, and I often will tell my patients sometimes if they have primary hyperparathyroidism and they have other indications for surgery or they're very symptomatic that I can't necessarily guarantee their symptoms will get better after surgery. So, you know, it, it's, it's very much, you know, a discussion with the patient and them understanding that, yes, they have X symptoms, but they may not improve on whether they're willing to go, to he go ahead with surgery on that basis, because those symptoms of fatigue and bone pain can be quite nonspecific. Now, having said that, um, the investigations, the bone mineral density and the asymptomatic renal calculi, those are all very important in the patient with asymptomatic um, um, hyperparathyroidism in trying to make the decision, well, whether or do they have this evidence of, of subclinical end organ damage that will make you go ahead or, or warrant surgical intervention. Whereas I agree with the majority of the audience that the negative cestin maybe scan is really, the role of that is really localization. It's not to make the diagnosis and it's not to, to determine whether or not to go ahead with surgery, but rather it's the, the role of the cestin maybe or any imaging is to make the surgery easier after that decision has been made. And with that, I think that's a perfect segue to our next speaker. Thank you kindly. I think we kind of answered Dr. Conradi's question with, with my question, so um, I'm happy to continue with Florette. Go for it. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Maybe just put it on the um, slideshow view. Okay, cool. Thanks so much to the organizers for um, the opportunity to present at tonight's webinar. I'm going to be covering parathyroid imaging with a um, particular focus on parathyroid scintigraphy as I'm a nuclear physician. So I'm going to start off with a bit of history. Um, the parathyroid lens were the last anatomical discovery um, and this was discovered in 1880 by a Swedish medical student by the, the name of Ivor Victor Sundström. And I'm sure he would have been very proud to see that this whole webinar is dedicated to what he discovered. 
Unfortunately, initially, it didn't really attract much attention and was only discovered later that there's a relationship to significant bone disease. And 45 years after the first, um, after he discovered the parathyroid lens, the first parathyroidectomy was done in 1925 by Felix Mandel in Vienna. Now, Dr. Wade already um, spoke about this, but I just want to reiterate it. Primary hyperparathyroidism can be caused by neoplasia, and as she mentioned, about 80% of cases will be caused by solitary parathyroid adenomas. It can also be caused by carcinoma, a parathyroid carcinoma, which is quite rare, and then the remainder would be um, multi-gland disease, either in the form of double or multiple parathyroid adenomas, or then parathyroid hyperplasia. And in and patients with primary hyperparathyroidism, surgical removal is the only curative option. So bilateral neck exploration with intraoperative localization of the parathyroid lens is the um, mainstay of therapy. But as the um, most of these cases will be caused by a solitary parathyroid adenoma, there's a move towards a minimal invasive surgical approach. And this is where preoperative localization becomes important. So what can we use? We have several techniques available, and that just comes to show that none of these are really ideal. With regards to invasive techniques, such as parathyroid arteriography and selective venous sampling, um, are reliable, but these are um, time consuming, they are, they are technically difficult, and they come with um, complications such as stroke, hematoma, contrast induced nephropathy, to name a few. Um, Non-invasive techniques can be divided into morphological and scintigraphic um, imaging modalities, and once again, the, these are numerous. From a morphological point of view, one can do ultrasound, CT, 4D CT, and MRI with excellent image re resolution and contrast, but variable accuracy. And some of these imaging modalities cannot differentiate functional and parathyroid tissue from other tissue. Um, with regards to what we can do in nuclear medicine, um, MIBI scintigraphy is the most widely used single preoperative localization imaging method, and I'll, I'll speak more about that soon. Uh, there's a lot of work being done in the field of PET-CT with carbon-11 methionine and F18 fluorocholine with promising results, but as most of you guys I'm surely are aware is that PET-CT is quite an expensive investigation, and we unfortunately in South Africa don't have these traces readily available. So where does this leave us? There's been numerous um, research or a lot of research being done comparing different imaging modalities to try and find what works best. And I think like Dr. Wade has um, told you already, um, parathyroid scintigraphy has quite a good sensitivity and positive predictive value, but it's been shown that if you use it in conjunction with ultrasound and there's concordant results, that it increases the sensitivity quite significantly. So um, this was actually published quite recently in the um, Journal of New um, Clinical Nuclear Medicine, um, and it shows that, or their suggested option is that as first-line imaging, one should use a dual tracer protocol together with neck ultrasound. And the advantage of adding a neck ultrasound is that you can, at the same time, look at your thyroid gland to see if there's any underlying pathology, as this occurs in up to 50% of patients with primary hyperparathyroidism. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on parathyroid scintigraphy. The initial protocol that was used in the early 1980s used thallium-201. Um, this is a cationic potassium analog, and it's taken up by active sodium potassium ATPase pump, and it takes up in parathyroid and thyroid tissue. But unfortunately, it has less than ideal physical characteristics when it comes to gamma camera imaging, and it also results in an increased radiation burden to the patient. So this was basically replaced by technetium 99M system MIBI, which is the currently preferred tracer. System MIBI is a cationic lipophilic isonitrile derivative, and it's taken up in cells with high mitochondrial concentration, and it's thought to be because of a negative transmembrane potential of the mitochondria. And therefore, detectability is related to the presence of mitochondria-rich oxyphil cells. So there are two different methods that can be followed, a dual tracer or um, with or without a, a dual phase, sorry, with or without a dual tracer protocol. 
So the dual phase protocol is based on the um, early and delayed phase imaging, and it it's because of differential washout of system maybe from normal thyroid tissue versus abnormal or hyperfunctioning parathyroid tissue. And then the dual tracer protocol is where you would add a, a, a second isotope, either iodine-123 or technetium-99 in protechnitate, which is taken up purely by your thyroid gland. You'll do a subtraction, and then whatever is left is technically then abnormal or hyperfunctioning parathyroid tissue. One can do two-dimensional plane imaging with penal collimation to increase your um, field of view or magnif magnification as the parathyroid adenomas tend to be quite small. And then you can also add SPECT imaging, which is a 3D rendering to increase your contrast resolution, or SPECT CT that can be done with hybrid um, cameras or can be manually fused with software. So this is just an example of a dual phase um, protocol. On the left hand side, the two columns would um, the images were t done with technetium and um, cestamibi, and on the right hand side with tetraphosmin. Tetraphosmin is a lipophilic cationic diphosphine, which works in a similar manner compared to cestamibi, but the differential washout is not as great, and that therefore it hasn't really taken off as a, um, a tracer. In, when it comes to localizing parathyroid adenomas. And one can appreciate that if you do image these patients at different time intervals, there is washout and one can see at the bottom left corner a clear focus of retention con and consistent with a parathyroid adenoma. This is a dual tracer protocol. So the on the left-hand side, the thyroid imaging with technetium 99M per technetate, the middle column, the cesta maybe, and then the subtraction imaging on the right-hand side showing clear foci of mismatching cesta maybe uptake indicative of parathyroid adenomas. And this is just an example of a SPECT CT image showing an eutopic left inferior parathyroid adenoma with delayed washout. And you can see here that you can now start getting an idea of where the parathyroid adenoma is located in relation to the thyroid gland, which is not possible on planar imaging. Factors affecting our scan sensitivity um, include the tracer and the technique used, as I've mentioned already. Um, in, the pa in patients where a dual tracer protocol is used, for instance, you need your patient to be very to lie very still between the acquisition of the system maybe and the patechnitate images. If, if not, there might be um, artifacts being caused during the subtraction, which is not ideal. The lesion characteristics also play quite a big um, role. So the smaller the size, the more difficult it's going to be for us to see, and also cellularity of, abnormal gland, of the abnormal parathyroid gland. So fewer oxyphil cells might result in more rapid washout of the tracer. And to try and circumvent this, one can do, one can do tomographic imaging or SPECT imaging during your early phase to try and see the parathyroid adenoma prior to washout of the tracer. It's also been found that patients with parathyroid adenomas with significant pea glycoprotein um, expression, which is a membrane transporter uh, encoded for by the multidrug resistant gene, has a greater efflux of the tracer and therefore also greater washout and may, may result in a false negative finding. We also have lower sensitivity in multi-gland disease, and this is thought to be as a result of the smaller size of the parathyroid glands, as well as a predominant chief cell composition. Just quickly on atypical washout of the radio tracer, I've already mentioned the um, scenarios where you would expect fast parathyroid washout, but another part of that would be if you've got delayed thyroid gland washout. And slower thyroid gland washout occurs in patients with underlying thyroid disease, such as multinodular goiters, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, thyroid adenoma, and thyroid carcinoma. And this can be seen in up to 50% of patients referred to us. And this is where your dual tracer protocol or then ultrasound plays quite an important role. Other reasons for false positive um, findings, um, as I've mentioned, the system maybe takes up in areas where there's high mitochondria, so cells with high metabolic activity, and therefore we can see uptake in malignant tumors such as breast cancer, lung cancer, head and neck carcinomas, and their nodal and osseous metastases, as well as bronchial carcinoids. One can also expect to see uptake in some cases of thoracic sarcoidosis, in hyperplastic and in a hyperplastic thymus, in Brown's tumors, which are related to hyperparathyroidism, but luckily quite rare. And then also we, one can see system maybe uptake in brown fat. 
So the rest of my presentation, I'm going to show a few examples, seeing as it is based on imaging, and I divided these into the good, the bad, the ugly, and the missing. So the good example is just a good example of parathyroid adenoma. This was a 59-year-old female patient who was referred to us with um, biochemically proven primary hyperparathyroidism. She had a thyroid ultrasound prior to her um, investigation, which showed a small mucinous nodule infra at the inframedial aspect of the left thyroid lobe. And if you look at the images here, if you can see my cursor, this image here is the delayed MIBI image showing a clear focus of abnormal uptake medial to the um, inferior part of the right thyroid lobe. This is the pinhole image of the technetium petechnetate image, which shows fairly uniform uptake throughout the thyroid gland with no clear areas of or no clear discrete um, cold nodules. And then this image here on the right hand side shows a clear focus of mismatching system movement uptake consistent with the parathyroid adenoma. The next case is a bad case because we were actually caught out with um, this and it just comes to show that you have to keep in mind that there's a lot of false positives in the setting. It's a 62-year-old female patient who was referred with the history of arrhythmia, dyslipidemia, and hypertension, once again by chemically proven hyperpar primary hyperparathyroidism, and was sent to a different practice initially for a dual-phase system, maybe um, parathyroid scintigraphy, which reported a large left inferior hyperfunctioning parathyroid adenoma. She was then subsequently referred to our practice to be scanned on the day of surgery, which unfortunately precluded imaging of the thyroid gland with protechnitate. And one can see here where the red arrow is pointed, a large focus of um, prominent system maybe accumulation on the early images already. She was taken to theater subsequently and a left lobectomy, thyroid lobectomy was done. This, um, the, the, the nodule that's marked with the surgical material was thought to be the parathyroid adenoma but then lo and behold came back as a follicular variant of a pillory thyroid carcinoma, and she had persistent and um, primary hyperparathyroidism. So we repeated her parathyroid scintigraphy in early June of 2021. So now it becomes more evident that there's a focus of mismatching system EV uptake inferior to the left thyroid bed which in retrospect was actually there on the initial images, but I think because of the big focus of uptake, we didn't really make much of it. So she was taken back to theater for completion thyroidectomy. The left inferior parathyroid land showed that there was a parathyroid adenoma indeed, but what was not clearly seen on scintigraphy was that the right superior parathyroid land also had an adenoma. And I think this just comes to show that it in smaller um, lesions, we might miss it. And then the third case is the ugly. And I'm sure if if there's any one of you guys who thought that we do unclear medicine, based on this case, I would agree with you. It's a 76-year-old male patient who was referred to as with end-stage renal failure, a markedly elevated parathyroid hormone level, and marginally elevated um, corrected calcium level. So. Based on the previous examples, I'm sure you guys can appreciate that there's not a clear parathyroid adenoma. But on the earlier images, the panel images here, if you use your imagination, you would would you would or you might see that there, oh, sorry, that there's four dots that might represent parathyroid hyperplasia, and this just comes to show that it's more difficult to diagnose this. And then the last case, um, the missing oic topic. This is a 53-year-old female patient with a history of chronic kidney disease on hemodialysis. She had a history of previous parathyroidectomy in 2012, where they removed the left superior and inferior, as well as the right superior parathyroid glands, which came back and um, as hyperplastic glands, and then was referred to us in 2019 for um, imaging as she had recurrent hyperparathyroidism. And in the inferior pole of the right lobe, it does appear that there's a focus of a more prominent uptake. She was taken back to theater and this came back as parathyroid hyperplasia again. She was referred to our practice in um, earlier this year with a parathyroid, um, again, an elevated PTH and corrected calcium. And um, this was the imaging obtained on that day. So where the circle is, there's a faint focus of um, uptake. So we went ahead and did tomographic imaging, which showed the focus um, of system movie accumulation in the anterior mediastinum. 
She then had a CT, which showed a soft tissue nodule in the antero superior mediastinum, which correlated to what we saw on our study, and this was proven to be an ectopic parathyroid adenoma. So in conclusion, um, preoperative localization becomes important in cases where one wants to do minimally invasive or want to, where you want to follow a minimally invasive approach. And parathyroid scintigraphy with Sistamibi is the most widely used as a single preoperative localization imaging method with good sensitivity. It reduces operative time, cost, and operative failure rates, but an ultrasound is quite imperative, especially in cases where there is underlying thyroid disease to prevent reporting false positives. Thank you for your attention. Lovely. Thank you, Florette. Um, if I may, for a matter of time, I'm actually only going to take one poll question, if that's okay. That's perfect. Um, super. Uh, Ilza, if you don't mind, maybe you can put that up in the chat box straight away. Oh, here we go. All right, super. So what advantages does SPECT offer in addition to planar imaging? Um, I don't seem to be able to read the whole... Uh, okay, maybe I should share my screen again and then I can okay, just... Right. I don't seem to be able to read the whole thing on my meeting chat, sorry. No problem, I'm just going to show it again here. Okay, so the question is, what advantage does SPECT offer in addition to planar imaging? And the options are, it reduces the radiation um, to the patient, it offers no advantage, it increases contrast resolution, or it reduces imaging time. Super, thank you. Maybe while we wait, if I may ask a question just regarding why um, systemibi is not so accurate in multi-gland disease and parathyroid adenomas. Do you, do you, I mean, you talked about the factors affecting the scan sensitivity, but what's your theory on the multi-gland disease? Has it got to do with the activity of the mitochondria or just the small size? Um, mm. It's a combination of both. So, well, that's what we think is that it is because of the smaller size, it makes it more difficult to detect it. And the other thing is that these um, per, the hyperplastic um, glands have a chief cell composition and not oxyphil, and because of that, there's reduced mitochondria and less uptake. Super, lovely. Thanks. So it looks like overwhelming 80% of people believe it just increases contrast resolution. Is Perfect. I don't know about it, if it's too easy or whether people listen, <laughs> but that's the right answer. Surgeons after all. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you, Floretta. I really appreciate your, uh, your time and preparation. Um, and I think on that note, um, let's get down to the, uh, the business of surgery. Um, Johanna, do you want to comment on anything else or can I, can I recommend uh, that Ellen start straight away? Mark, maybe um, we can just quickly ask Prof uh, Shahar. Prof, you want one or two comments while um, well, Dr. Keynes is busy getting his, um, his presentation after this um, pre-surgical um, lectures that we had? I think both the presentations were superb. Uh, the first presentation was wonderful. I think she, it looks like Alicia has passion for parathyroid, you know, and you need an endocrinologist like that before you put a knife on the patient's neck. I think the message should be don't operate on the patient just looking at one of the scans and saying, I want to operate on the patient. There are a lot of false positive, false negative, and you need somebody like her to tell this is this patient will be benefited by surgery. And that comes from experience and talking. You need to develop a multidisciplinary team, what I call a parathyroid armamentarium. And if you have that, your success rate will be very high. Overall, the success rate of parathyroid surgery is 95%. It is not the success in medicine that is important. It's a failure in medicine that is more important. Those 5% of the patients where we fail, they haunt you for the rest of your life because you don't know what to do and you try to spend, send them to 
uh, NIH or some other institution. So if you have an endocrinologist like that who will define the indications for surgery, very helpful. And I think Florida did a great job of uh, defining the localization that is available in your country. And during the, the case mm -hmm. discussion, we discussed, we give more credence in 4D CT scan, but we'll talk about that later on. But both presentations were wonderful. I hope the audience takes advantage of those and we review it. Thank you, Prof. Appreciate it. Um, Alan, if you are not um, not minding to um, to show us what we are here for. Thanks, Johan. Thanks very much for this initiative and Sanos and Medtronic. I'll just share my screen. Um, is that coming up at all? Not yet, Alan. Not yet. Okay, sorry. I seem to want to be sharing here. Um, It's just in a different format, so I'm going to try again. Anything yet? I'm afraid not. Okay. Elsa, do you think maybe you can help? Um, I'm sure you have the video as well. Yeah, it was corrupted on the other uh. format, so I'm just going to try again from the start. Sorry, I'm just going to start again. It's open on my screen, it's just not sharing. This. Uh, sorry, George, I can you just mute yourself? Thank you, sir. Getting this. Is that sharing now? Yes, it is. Okay. Are you seeing the video now? I see your um, your screen's full of files. No, I don't see a video yet. Maybe on the top right there somewhere. It looks like um. Yeah, I'm opening the video. And now? I'm afraid not. Okay, sorry. Uh, Alan, it will open up in a different window. So when you click on it, it will open up on a different window. You'll just need to go and look at which of your windows are open and share the, the window with the open uh, video. Okay. So it's just not sharing at all. Prof Shahar, in the meantime, would you maybe um, comment on your thoughts regarding the 4D CT scan, if you like? Yeah, you know, the 4D CT scan started in the United States about, I would say, eight to ten years back. The initial interest came from MD Anderson, and it has been picked up by everybody. There are a couple of things about 4D CT scan. Number one, it tells you the exact location of the enlarged parathyroid. And if your radiologists are... Uh, quite confident and they are they have the whole way to weigh the parathyroid gland so they can tell the right upper parathyroid gland is 500 milligram the right lower parathyroid gland is 300 milligram so this uh, getting the detailed information will help you to decide preoperatively what exactly you want to do if the four parathyroid glands, each one is 300 milligram, then you know that you are dealing with a multiglandular disease and you may be prepared to do either subtotal parathyroidectomy or parathyroidectomy with autotransplantation. Um, it also gives you the exact location 
Obviously, when you do the parathyroid scan, you also get the image of the thyroid, so you know if there is any abnormality in the thyroid. But this is one more test compared to ultrasound or uh, uh, a systemic B scan. Um, it has become very popular. Uh, the luckily, the insurance companies approve it, and I think it has become the first go-to investigation for hyperparathyroidism in majority of the parathyroid centers in USA. Mark, are you seeing anything yet? Um, I'm seeing your um, your list of files, but not actually the, oh, the video yet. Uh, all I'm getting up here on my screen is my video and nothing else. Um, uh, sorry, can I assist? Can I share for you? Are you comfortable with that? Yeah, it's just not opening up my actual video. Um, Alan, can I assist? Thanks, yeah, Nikki. please. Roshal, oh, maybe another question to you. Sure. Um, looking for while you're waiting for the video. So some some tips for the junior surgeons around the table in terms of the approach. Um, obviously, we're going to talk about minimally invasive parathyroid surgery as well. But I mean, some tips from your side. It's, it's a vague yeah. question, but you okay. you've got a lot of experience. So the first oh. principle of okay. okay, you want me to wait? We'll come later on. Go ahead, Alan. Thank you. Well done. Okay, let's see now. Right, can you see that now? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Finally, sorry about that. Um, right, so I'm just going to go through two videos. Um, these are recent cases, both primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, this, essentially, my technique is fairly standard for all patients. I use a, a, an open technique, which is a central approach. Um, it, it's not a, you know, a traditionally large, open, sort of wide collar incision. Um, and I definitely rely on preoperative imaging in the form of ultrasound and system EB scan. Um, I tend to focus on the side of the neck where my imaging has shown um, pathology, and if I identify it, I limit it to that side. I try and see essentially the adenoma, and then I look at a normal gland, and if I'm happy that the other gland on that side's normal, that's where I end the surgery. So this patient is a 78-year-old who presented with um, symptoms and osteoporosis. She had concordant imaging, so I'm just going to run through. This is a suprasternal sort of pretracheal collar incision. Um, if you're going for a more directed approach, you can go more lateral in this. So this patient is essentially supine with um, a little bit of a shoulder roll, but um, she's essentially straight. And that's uh, an incision placed usually in a skin crease. But if not, if they don't have an appropriate skin crease at that level, then usually something parallel to a skin crease, and those tend to heal really well and without much scarring. Um, so we were using two cameras just to orientate you. One was mounted um, just next to the table, and the other one, there was a, a videographer guy who was sort of standing quite high up above. So. We try to do most of the filming just um, sort of over my shoulder and we did move it during the op. Um, it's not the easiest surgery to film just due to the size. So these are essentially subplatysmal flaps and in an avascular plane, staying away from the anterior jugular veins. Um, I think the degree of how far you raise your skin flaps is personal preference. There are some papers now about very, very limited skin flap elevation. Um, and it's been defined before going right up to the sort of thyroid cartilage. I try and limit my skin flaps um, and just stay above the veins in an avascular plane, as I mentioned. Sorry for my head popping in and out of the video. Um, and so, so we missed a bit of something. There was a, a, 
the step edited out there. So essentially, the, the flaps are elevated and then the, the strap muscles are open in the midline rafe. And um, you then go in between the strap muscle and the thigh root gland, which is a fairly avascular plane. There are some small blood vessels that might cross over between the strap muscles and the thyroid gland. Um, and what does help, I don't do it routinely, but you can certainly take down the middle thyroid vein just to mobilize the thyroid gland a bit better. Um, so I've now got a, a peanut retractor on the thyroid gland and my assistant has the retractor underneath the strap muscle. Um, I use a lot of bipolar diathermy because you can use a, a one-handed technique where you can sort of um, burn and pinch. And I'm holding the thyroid myself with the peanut gland. And we're now, camera is essentially orientated at the head of the table looking down. So this patient had an enlarged left lower parathyroid gland, which I'm just exposing there. It was quite far down. Um, sometimes we see parathyroids in this territory essentially described as thyrothymic that may extend all the way down to the thymic remnant. I don't think this was a true thyrothymic gland, but certainly was a lower position. Um, and this was concordant on imaging. So both the ultrasound and the system EV said it was left lower. I do find not uncommonly where, that where the imaging mentions a lower gland, it can well be the upper gland that has extended downward into what your radiologist or nuclear physician will see as a lower gland on their imaging. But it's quite common for the upper glands to enlarge downward. And that can be a gravitational thing with a large gland. It's well defined. Um, and sometimes it's, if the gland is mid-pole, it's quite difficult to ascertain whether it's upper or lower. And I think that's where it's important to um, identify your recurrent laryngeal nerve and see the relation of the position to the gland. So your inferior gland is usually going to be ventral or anterior to the recurrent laryngeal, and your superior gland is usually posterior or dorsal to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So what I'm doing here is really just defining where the pedicle is to this enlarged parathyroid. Um, and the lower aspect of it is essentially going just behind, down below the sternum into the sternal notch. But I'm really just trying to identify all the blood vessels. The other important thing I think to mention is that you shouldn't really try and grasp the gland directly. So I'm just holding the sort of capsular tissues around the parathyroid so as not to handle it directly. Um, because if you do, you can open up the capsule of the gland and it bleeds quite excessively. And you also don't really want to spill cells from the parathyroid adenoma into the surrounding tissue. So it's really just a matter of gentle mobilization, um, finding the pedicle. I don't routinely identify the recurrent laryngeal nerve, but I use a nerve monitor. I have it available. Um, it's in my theater. So what I usually do, and I think there's a picture just now, is I just map out the position of where that recurrent laryngeal nerve is running. And as I said, in cases where you're not sure if it's an upper or lower parathyroid, it really does help to identify where that recurrent laryngeal is running. And that's really just to document which gland you've removed, um, just in case there's any further surgery down the line. So that's the main vascular pedicle. Um, most parathyroid glands are vascularized off branches of the inferior thyroid artery. And I'm usually quite happy just to burn that. Some people use Liger clips. Um, I certainly don't feel there's a need for any other type of energy device during this kind of operation. Um, and that's the gland almost out. The final bits of tissue around it. Um, so I think there's some tricks with parathyroids if they're not where you expect them to be. The lower glands are usually within 
a centimeter of the lower pole of the thyroid gland. So 50% of them are sort of a centimeter around or behind the lower pole of the gland. And another 25% are usually in this sort of thyrothymic position, which is extending down into the region of the thymus. So that was a solitary parathyroid adenoma. I did look at the upper gland, which was normal. And this patient's bloods, I usually then do a PTH level on the night. And her PTH level had come back down to normal within a few hours of surgery. And her calcium then followed. And they'll usually go home first thing the next morning. Um, we don't have intraoperative PTH, so um, hence why I s sort of look at two glands, which is the diseased one, and then I try and look at one other, which is just really to exclude the possibility of hyperplasia. Um, I put a single suture into the uh, straps and then close platysma and then close skin. And we put a small dressing over that and the patient is then taken out to recovery. So this is a second case. Now this is just ident this is a patient who also had Hashimoto's disease of the thyroid. She had discordant imaging. So what I'm showing there is the um let's check which gland it was. So that's the sort of left mid pole parathyroid, and that's what was identified on ultrasound. The cystomebi identified uptake in the position of the right lower parathyroid. So this is the gland on the left, which um, to me looked enlarged, and you can see there's some cystic little changes and nodularity within it. It shows a typical gliding sign, which is described with parathyroids. They sit within the capsule and they have a fatty surrounding and it shows you the typical gliding motion. So this gland, um, when I ident identify the nerve, and I'll just show you, there'll be some mapping out now of the nerve with a nerve monitor, was the the left lower parathyroid. So there I'm just mapping out where the nerve is running. Um, so that gland I removed and was sitting at just over a centimeter. Um, and that was the sonar positive gland. I've now gone across to the right side of the neck and again the camera's at the head of the bed um, going showing downwards. And I'm now looking at what the nuclear scan was showing. So I think even if I identified a gland which I felt was enlarged, if I had discordant imaging, I usually would look on the other side of the neck um, just to make sure that I didn't miss a second gland or multi-gland disease. And here you can see I'm just mobilizing the thyroid away with the peanut going down to the carotid sheath. And let's just try to speed that along. So there you can see the carotid artery. Um, I'm holding the thyroid, again, pulling it medially, and you can start to see quite a large parathyroid gland sitting right down medial to the carotid artery. And this was a significantly enlarged gland. Um, the nuclear scan said it was a lower, and it was most definitely an upper gland that had enlarged downwards um, lateral to the recurrent laryngeal nerve and was extending all the way down almost to the lower pole of the thyroid gland. So you can see quite easily why they describe these as lower glands when quite often they are upper. But the pedicle of that parathyroid was definitely sitting up and posterior to the insertion of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, so I'm just dissecting it out. And... Because of her Hashimoto's, there was some adhesions, perithyroidal adhesions, but you can see this parathyroid is coming out quite nicely from right down next to the carotid sheath. And I think this is one of the areas where um, parathyroid glands are missed in the deep sort of recess medial to the carotid or all the way down um, towards the tracheoesophageal groove. And this is quite a common place to look if you don't find 
the parathyroid in its typical described position. Um, I'm just going to speed this along. And I'm just going to show you. So again, you can see I'm just holding that tissue surrounding that parathyroid and freeing it up. The tissue, she was quite edematous and had some adhesions around it. But I'm again now just mapping out where that recurrent laryngeal nerve is running. And once I'm happy, I'll carry on um, dissecting and burning away the blood vessels. So this is quite an, a large parathyroid. And so what I took out in this patient was the left lower and the right upper. And I did identify one of the other parathyroid glands, which was normal. Um, so I was happy that she didn't have hyperplasia. And what she did have was this gland was identified as an adenoma. And despite the left-sided gland looking macroscopically enlarged and its weight was actually above normal, but the pathologist um, basically uh, assessed that gland as being a normal parathyroid. But the fact that it was enlarged on ultrasound and macroscopically, I wasn't happy to leave it, leave it intact. But this gland being the right upper was essentially the site of the pathology. There it is, almost out. So a nice big gland, just about one and a half centimeters in size. And again, I don't routinely use drains in these patients. Um, and we, um, I usually just leave this dressing on for three or four days and then we remove it. And I find it heals very well. And those are the videos. Superb, Alan. Thank you. Uh, oh. Prof, um, can I ask for any comments from your side and just how your approach is? I know um, units over there are doing a lot of focused or minimally invasive with, in conjunction with intraoperative PTH. Yeah, you know, we are quite... Uh, let me put it this way. In majority of the parathyroid centers in the United States, the intraoperative PTH is readily available. Uh, and the timing has, the timing or the amount of time we used to take has gone down quite a bit. At one time, it was 45 minutes. Now we can get the intraoperative PTH within 13 to 14 minutes. And the person who does the, the intraoperative PTH has a portable, you know, the cart. They bring the machine right next to the operating room or in the operating room. So the transit time has gone down quite a bit. We used to spend more time getting from the operating room to the laboratory. So um, if we're going to do the minimally invasive parathyroid surgery, I think the intraoperative PTH is a, a um, um, definite advantage. Is it a must? Absolutely not. But it, is it advantageous? Yes. Now, there is, there is some um, different opinion about this. If your Sistram BB scan or a 4D CT scan shows a big adenoma, at the time of surgery, you saw a big adenoma, the success is 95%. So why punish 100% of the people for benefit of 5%? So that is another thought, that don't do intraoperative PTH, do it in the recovery room or do it next day. Those are the patients who may have to come back but that number is generally very small. And if you do a good localization study, good history, you know this is probably not a multi-glandular disease. But the general philosophy in the United States is if you're going to go for the focus exploration or a minimally invasive surgery, you should have the availability of intraoperative PTH. So we, we don't have it available here, but again, I usually rely essentially on we, we've done a couple of minimally invasive and it's usually more in our frail patients and we've done a couple under local anesthesia. Yeah. But uh, certainly my normal approach is, is a, a, a pretracheal small collar incision above the notch. Yeah. And um, I like to see one normal gland and it's usually on the side of the disease. 
And every now and then, I think last week I had a true double adenoma. So every now and then you're going to see and yeah. get caught out. But fortunately, the ultrasound had picked up two glands. Um, but my usual approach is just to try and stay on one side of the neck and, and leave it at that. Agreed. I think that was our practice before the intraoperative BTH. We'll go for the one big gland while you are getting a frozen section, which was a common investigation that time. Uh, then, then look for another gland. If that looks enlarged, then go for the other side. You know, quite often in the olden days, you know, when we took long time to get the PT, uh, the frozen section. Now we call them and they are ready to do it right away. If you take a long time, and then the surgeon is not going to stay idle in the operating room. He's going to look on the other side. <laughs> Takes a few more minutes to make sure that in the heart of your heart, you know, there is nothing abnormal on the other side. But again, I just want to bring up the one issue about exposure. I think the exposure is very important in parathyroid. Any surgery, forget about parathyroid, any thyroid, uh, uh, neurosurgery, everything. Exposure is a key. However, if you're going to make a small incision, you got to make sure you don't fracture the parathyroid. And I think Alan will agree with me that you are going to do the dissection away from the parathyroid, not on the parathyroid. You don't want to break the capsule. You don't want to break the parathyroid and have the fragments left behind, which will lead to para parathyromatosis, which is a difficult condition to handle. When you see a patient with parathyromatosis, send them to Alan Keynes, you know. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Mark, I don't have any poll questions, so I'm not sure if you want to go straight on to the no case problem. studies. In fact, uh, I have two questions from from the audience um i'm going to go with george gomes's question first with regards to the role of intraoperative frozen section uh, prof shaha mentioned it um it certainly was an option um uh, more in the past uh, i don't know if anyone still uses it my 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 question in addition to that would be the possibility of maybe gamma probes if you're going to be doing a cyst of maybe on the day of surgery um prof if you want to uh, comment on those two things yeah, the gamma probe was very popular once upon a time in few institutions in the United States, not many. The, uh, the uh, Tampa uh, Parathyroid Center used to do that very routinely. I'm not sure whether they are that hot now or not, because now they do bilateral exploration. But that was a common uh, investigation that time to use the gamma probe. I wrote a paper against it uh, at one time because it did not help. When you see a gamma you know, you do the systemic B scan and you see a big adenoma, you don't need a gamma probe to find it. So we we didn't use it very much. But I must say, if you have done a gamma probe, it is a functional frozen section of the parathyroid. Mm. If the uptake in that parathyroid is more than 20 percent, you know, this is a parathyroid gland. Why do we still send for frozen section? It gives you a happiness, you know. You keep pathologists busy. You know, why should, as a surgeon, I should be most busy? Let them work also with us. It gives you a good a good feeling that you, you did find a parathyroid adenoma. Sometimes they will say it is hypercellular parathyroid. You say, okay, let's wait for the final report. But the critical aspect to me in the parathyroid is what is the weight of the parathyroid? And I'm, I'm going to go back to the basic principle of parathyroid surgery. The normal weight is 35 to 50 milligram. If your parathyroid gland is 150, it is more likely to be hypercellular. If it is 500 or 1000, you know it is a parathyroid adenoma. And as Alan said, you look for one more that is normal, call it quit, perfectly okay. In spite of that, you will have two to three percent failure either next day of surgery or six months or eight months after surgery. And those are the cases you do extensive investigation, re-evaluate whether the surgery is indicated, ask Alicia, do you really want me to reoperate on this patient or can we manage medically? Super. Super. If I may, um, Chris asked the question, how to choose between three and a half gland versus total parathyroidic parathyroidectomies with auto transplantation in multi-gland disease, uh, or maybe he means uh, hypoplastic parathyroids. How do you decide between totals with reimplantation or uh, three and a half? You want me to take that? Go for it, Prof. The floor okay. is yours. So, you know, the at one time when we operated on renal failure patients, it was common practice to do total parathyroidectomy and re 
implantation or auto transplantation. I think majority of the people are now going away from that, trying to leave half the parathyroid or one full small parathyroid behind for two reasons. Number one, if that remaining gland, uh, when, you, when you take out all the four parathyroid glands, you have to have a uh, availability of cryopreservation because you've got to keep some parathyroid in reserve in case your autotransplanted parathyroid does not work. And the second reason is in renal failure patients, when you autotransplant, especially in the forearm, they can come back with the re-hyperparathyroidism from that autotransplanted tissue. So our current philosophy in a multiglandular disease, unless it is truly a renal failure secondary gland, to do a subtotal parathyroidectomy or do three and a half parathyroidectomy. Super. Excellent. Um, I think uh, if everyone's okay, shall we progress directly to the um, to the case studies? I think, um, Ellen, do you have them or uh, I don't know if... Um, so Alicia's got two and I've got two. Mark, if I can make Alicia, a Yep. I can make a suggestion. Let's start with Alan's cases. He's got some nice cases um, suggested by Alicia, and then we can go back to Alicia's cases and take it from there. Super. Maybe while he's opening, Prof. Um, once again, I mean the whole focus of this uh, uh, webinar is to literally uh, include everyone. I mean, from junior to experience. So, what is your? I'm going to ask the question again. I mean, this is also appropriate for thyroid surgery. For the un untrained eye, what is your tips? For the for the for the surgeon looking for a parathyroid, there has been a lot written about this in the United States. Some with pride, some with humbleness, and some with despair. You know, and, and whether you do a craniotomy, you do abdominal perineal or abdominal uh, aneurysm, I think experience does count. There is absolutely no doubt. The problem is. Even in the United States, you know, we always talk that thyroid surgery should be done in an experience center with a surgeon more experienced than 30, 50. Nobody knows the real number. Nobody knows the real number of the parathyroid. But what counts is, do you have the, all, the available, all the means available? Do you have Alicia standing behind you? Do you know the indication for surgery? Do you have a good localization? And then, you know, whether you do 10 cases a year or five cases a year, it, I don't think it matters. It also, ma nobody puts that in the equation, how many years you are in practice. You know, we just talk about the number of cases done every year. But again, you have to realize that there is a lot of interest now in the, in the referral to a specialized center or the surgeon volume and the surgeon experience. I think that is, there is no doubt that is most important, but that does not mean that you do 20, it doesn't mean that you're going to fail in the next one. Thanks, Mark, can you, see, can you see the slide? No, I'm afraid not. There we go again. <laughs> Let me just try and share that. Just on that note, with regards to trying to identify parathyroids in the in the in the neck, I mean, when I was a reg, I remember you know getting taught that lymph nodes are typically pink, um, parathyroids are caramel color, yeah. and um, and uh, uh, what was the other thing? The fat is yellow. The what? Sorry, the flat fat is yellow. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So it was really just a color, a color thing. And, and as Prof Shah said, the more you see them, the more you start to see the caramel distinguished between the, between the difference. So um, yeah, but it takes a bit of time. There is a better color definition for that. Tongue yeah. of a hummingbird, you know. <laughs> tongue of a hummingbird. I've never seen hummingbird. I've never <laughs> seen hummingbird's tongue. But I know what it looks like because I know what parathyroid looks like. <laughs> I'll go uh, Google Martin, is that slide come it up? Has, it has, Alan, go for it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to whip through this case. So this is a 56-year-old gentleman who uh, had a distal pancreatectomy for a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Um, gave a history of fatigue and generalized aches and pains. And during his admission for his pancreatic surgery was identified to have raised serum calcium and PTH. Not, not dramatic. Um, and PTH just essentially one above normal. 
had a MEBI which identified a left lower lesion which was concordant with ultrasound. Um, he was also diagnosed with a pituitary prolactinoma and the diagnosis was then made of MEN1. Um, so after recovery from his pancreatic surgery, he came back in and he had parathyroid exploration with bearing in mind that he was now diagnosed as an MEN1. Um, two of his glands were obviously enlarged and that was the left inferior that was picked up on imaging, but the right upper was also. And there was mild enlargement of the left upper, but his, his right lower gland was essentially macroscopically normal. So I left that intact and removed the other three, um, which I wouldn't have done if he didn't have a diagnosis of MEN1. Um, so that was his pathology at nodular hyperplasia, which is more aggressive than hyperplasia um, per se. So those three glands, and you can see the weights of them, one of them was up to a gram, um, were all diseased, uh, implying that the, the last gland was as well. His bloods the following day were back to normal. Um, interestingly, then his daughter presented to me a few months later. She'd also been diagnosed with MEN1, but had had surgery elsewhere where a right lower gland had been removed and pathologically labeled as a parathyroid adenoma. And she had also had a thyroid um, nodule removed. So everybody seeing these slides? Actually, no, Ellen, sorry, we, right. we got your, um, your opening slides, but... Um, ah, okay, sorry. Me... I'm advancing on them, but they're obviously not coming up for you. Um, yeah. Sorry. I'm just going to try and share again. No, any difference? Sorry, Alan, can I? Sorry, Alan, sorry mm. to interrupt. Just go yeah. to slideshow. Next to animation, just go to slideshow and then start from the beginning and then you can enhance from there. Yeah, that's what I've done. Because I think your connection is a bit slow, so it's not picking up on our side. Okay. Just go to the slideshow tab next to mm. animations. Yeah. Click on that one. From the beginning, yeah. Okay. Does it come up again? If it works, otherwise you just need to just go to the slide you were talking to. Okay. So I think the connection is a bit slow, so. So just see, has it come up from the first slide again? Yeah, we're on, on the first slide, but it's not going into presentation mode. Okay. Just on advance to the, the slide you were talking to. Okay, so I'm advancing through them. Is it changing at all on your side? Doesn't seem to be. No. Your connection, no. your connection is really slow, so it's not picking okay. up. Sorry. So essentially, the father was, you know, I removed three glands, all came back as nodular hyperplasia. But then the daughter presented having had surgery elsewhere where they took out a single gland, which showed a parathyroid adenoma histologically. Um, and they'd also removed a thyroid nodule. So I started at the beginning with her and I re-imaged her with ultrasound and cystamoebi and we found an enlarged left lower gland only. She had very mildly elevated PTH levels, but she was normal calcemic, but quite symptomatic. Um, so I explored her and, and only found one other enlarged gland, which was the left lower gland, which I removed. And her PTH and calcium levels were normal post up. And the pathology on that gland came back as well as an adenoma. So I think this, I'm just trying to highlight, I think the difficulty that it comes sometimes for pathologists to differentiate hyperplasia versus adenoma. So we've got two MEN patients from the same family, one where he had nodular hyperplasia of all these glands and the other who essentially had two adenomas. Um, and that's it for that case. So, Prof, I don't know if you have difficulty with your pathologists um, yes. sometimes telling you they can't differentiate between 
hyperplasia or adenomas and absolutely ne you know needing to see a normal rim of tissue yeah the entire philosophy yeah. of pathology let them tell you that you make your clinical judgment based on the imaging study the weight of the parathyroid etc is it a parathyroid adenoma? Now, many pathologists will see a rim of normal parathyroid with a with a neoplastic another gland. Then you know this is parathyroid adenoma and not hypercellular. If there is no rim of normal parathyroid and everything looks like an enlarged parathyroid, you know this is hypercellular. But again, you know, we don't expect the pathologist to tell us it is parathyroid adenoma versus hypercellular. As long as they tell me this is parathyroid and the weight of the parathyroid, I'm quite comfortable with that. Okay. So I'm just wondering about the implication for the other glands where you do deal with multi-gland disease as far as, you know, double, true double adenomas versus hyperplasia. Because I, yeah, I think there's variable penetrance for enlargement yeah. of hyperplastic glands. So sometimes when you do the surgery, you might find two significantly enlarged glands and two normal, and that's still in the setting of hyperplasia. Right. You know, I mean, again, this whole thing between the multiglandular disease, hypercellular or parathyroid adenomas, multiple parathyroid adenomas is, again, the, the way we talk to the pathologists and way we push them to report. I think it is a clinical judgment. Am I do, dealing with multiglandular disease or am I dealing with true multiple parathyroid adenomas? And I don't think we have right answer for that. Uh, there are many papers in the literature on multi, uh, multiple parathyroid adenomas, about 4 to 5 percent. And I'm not sure, unless you follow these patients for the rest of their life, and they never came back with hyperparathyroidism, then only you can say that they had two parathyroid adenomas. But I don't think these patients get lost very fast. You, you know, and they because they feel well, they go, they move out, they don't come to the same surgeon, or the surgeons get old. You know, this is a disease of decades. It's not a disease of months and years. It's a disease of decades. Perfect. I think that answers Mohammed's question, actually. Um, talking about the difference between adenomas and hyperplasias and frozen section can be very difficult. Yes, um, correct. Johan, do we have uh, time for another another case study? Yes, Mark. I think we can uh, we can do one more, and I think we must maybe um, get um, our endocrinologist and nuclear physician in, into play again. Um, <laughs> Alicia, I, yeah, Alicia, yeah, I think you've got we've got one case that is um, is um, the full house. Okay, so I have two cases. I think I'll, what I'll do is share the second one because I think that the first one is rather straightforward. Well, if we have time, we can actually do them pretty quickly, actually. So if you don't mind, let me share the first one. Okay. So shall I read this one? So Perfect. this was a 58-year-old woman. She came to me early this year, actually, with a six-year history of paresthesias. So she had had osteo she had a, a DEXA scan in December of last year, which revealed osteoporosis. And in an evaluation for that, she had her PTH done, it was elevated, and she was sent to me. So she had a history of several years of dull, nonspecific ache in her arms and legs, constipation, and muscle weakness, and that was a more recent onset. Her blood pressure was normal, her exam was otherwise unremarkable. I should actually do this for you guys, apologies. So her calcium was 2.93, PTH was 85. She had a 25 hydroxy vitamin D of 29 and her 24 hour urinary calcium was 6.36. Her um, GP had actually called me before she sent her to me. So I was able to tell her everything I needed done before she came to see me. Her fractional excretion of calcium was 4.3% and she had a T-score of minus 3.3 in, in her lumbar vertebrae. She had an abdominal ultrasound done, which showed a small, simple cyst, but no stones. An ultrasound of her neck did not visualize any parathyroid glands. So another quiz. So what would you do on this patient now? So would you do exploratory neck surgery? Would you do a Sestamibi scan? Would you observe her and repeat her um, parathyroid ultrasound in six months? Or would you offer her medical therapy for osteoporosis? Do you guys have that one set up, Nicolene? 
Yes. No. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I, I I struggled to unmute myself. Just give me a second. I'm gonna okay. I'm seeing it now. All right. I think while that comes up, if I may, um, Amos Macharia has asked about encountering post-op hungry bone syndrome much after these cases. Um, has anyone got experience with that? So what I'll say, I mean, we, I don't see it much. I used to see it before in, in the US. I don't see it much here. I think what's important is to make sure that the, the patient is appropriately managed preoperatively. So you want to make sure they're not vitamin D deficient. You want to make sure their phosphorus is, is adequately controlled. And usually once, you know, their pre-op metabolism is well managed. I, I, I can't say I've seen it actually since I've been here. Actually, I don't know if you see it much, Alan. You don't call me, so I'm not sure if it means you don't need no, me. You're handling it yourself. Um, quite rare. I probably maybe once a year have a patient also with, with Brown's tumors. So fortunately, those scenarios are diminishing. Um, we struggle mainly with our renal patients with our tertiary hyperparas with the calcium post-op. But um, again, we just make sure that they have vitamin D replete and usually make sure that they get some magnesium leading up to surgery. But true hungry bones um, also haven't really seen for the last couple of years. Yeah. And then just to emphasize while we're waiting for the poll to come up, vitamin D repletion should be with uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D. You know, some obviously if somebody's got renal impairment, then you want to use 125. But your average person off the street with normal renal function, you want to be giving them 25 hydroxy vitamin D. I mean, it's been trying to find it these days has been like hen's teeth with COVID because everybody's taking it because they think it's going to save them, which it doesn't. But um, um, oftentimes I will put these patients on calciferol. I have found even though the recommended dosage is 50,000 units once a week, it doesn't seem to budge my patients to any vitamin D level. So I usually use three times a week and, and higher if necessary. But obviously, usually for an eight week course and then reevaluate and repeat as necessary. OK, so our poll is up. So just to remind people, the question is, what would you do with that patient? Would you do exploratory surgery? Would you do assess to maybe scan, uh, observe and repeat or offer her medical therapy for her osteoporosis? In the interest of time, shall I go on? Please do. All right. So it seems as if most people would off would do a sesame B scan. And that is indeed what we did next. So obviously, this is a patient with fairly classic hyperparathyroidism who seems so even if one discounts her symptoms, she certainly has a calcium above 0.25 above the upper limit or normal. So surgery would be indicated. And then what we want to do is a sesame B scan to help us localize the gland. So I don't know if you want to jump in here, Florex, see if you can distinguish anything from the images. Sure, I must admit it's not. It's not great. You know, that's a kind of, you know, attractive. That's how we feel every day. <laughs> <laughs> but it does seem like um, this washout from, or progressive washout as the study goes along, and I would it, it, I get the impression that there's a focus of uh, retention in the inferior pole of the right thyroid lobe. So I don't know if there's a possible parathyroid adenoma there. Okay. So you were that our nuclear medicine physician agreed with you and he had the, the benefit of, I think, probably slightly better images. So she did undergo a right inferior parathyroidectomy and histology confirmed a parathyroid adenoma. So I've seen her postoperatively. She's eucalcemic. Interestingly, she actually reports improvement in her symptoms. So these paresthesias, which she's had for years, muscle weakness, she says they've got significantly better, though they're not completely resolved. Of course, it's difficult to know whether or not there is a psychosomatic component to it, but she feels much better. And then I haven't started her on any therapy for osteoporosis because we expect there to be significant improvement in bone density post-parathyroidectomy. So she'll have a bone density scan one year post-operatively. Should I jump to the second one? Uh, just Alicia, just a comment. I think the the symptoms of hyperparathyroidism are so vague exactly. and ill-defined that you cannot use the symptom as a to make a diagnosis. But 
once you operate on them and find a big adenoma, you know, next day they start getting so much improvement. They feel it was good. I'm glad I did, you know, the surgery. Some of the people have mental fogginess which changes. I don't know if it is truly mental fogginess or their better relation at the family. I have no idea, but they, they feel better next day. That is so true. I have seen so many patients with these very non-specific symptoms, and I always warn them beforehand that these may not get better, simply because it's so hard to say definitively that this is from the hyperparathyroidism. But virtually all of them come back and say, I feel better afterwards. Of course, the challenge is the people who don't feel better afterwards, but you no. Know, they go back to, to Google. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, shall I go on to the second case, Mark? I think so, please. Okay. So this is another patient who I saw many, many years ago. So she was a 34 year old female who came to me for evaluation of the elevated parathyroid hormone. She had taken um, ergocalciferol, so vitamin D for vitamin D deficiency. And she had a history of multiple episodes of renal calculi. So two months before I saw her, she'd had an ultrasound and that showed a seven millimeter hypoechoic nodule in the right mid pole of the thyroid. Blood pressure was normal and there was nothing else remarkable on her examination. So these were her initial lab tests when I saw her. So she'd had two calcium levels done, both of which were normal. Phosphorus was normal. She'd had one elevated parathyroid hormone in November of the previous year. And then just before I saw her, her parathyroid hormone was normal. On both occasions, she was vitamin D deficient. I mean, you can argue that under new guidelines, she was vitamin D sufficient in January and her GFR was 65. Would you operate on this patient? So I think we've got another poll there. I think we've got a, uh, so we've got someone, ah, here we go. Would you operate on this patient? So, so it seems like the majority of people are saying no, they would not operate on this patient. All right. I didn't operate on this patient. I wanted a little bit more information. So what I did next was to give her some vitamin D. So when I saw her again in March, she had a calcium remained normal, FOS normal. Her parathyroid hormone was still was now elevated again at 86.5. Her 25 hydroxy vitamin D was now over 30, and she had a GFR greater than 89, and her fractional excretion of sodium was just 1.6. She had a CT bone mineral density done, which showed low bone mineral density or osteopenia. And again, she had non-obstructing renal calculi. What would you do next? So would you continue vitamin D supplementation? Would you offer her a parathyroidectomy? Would you reevaluate her in six months? Or would you get her first degree family members and obtain calcium and parathyroid hormone results on them? Just wait for a few minutes for that one to come up. Do you have that um, poll, Nicolene? It's coming up. My system okay. is just lagging. It's coming. OK, thank you. Alicia, I think we want the answer from you. <laughs> want an answer from me. All right. So in the interest of time, let me tell you what we did. And I'm saying we because I implicate Alan in this as well. So what we actually did next was to offer her parathyroidectomy. And the reason for that 
was that we felt that her, and to be quite honest, I can't quite explain that low parathyroid in January of 2015, could have been a lab error, could just have been a natural fluctuation in parathyroid hormone. But we felt that between the results in November, the results in March, there was enough of a history of elevated parathyroid hormone, though again, bearing in mind, she did have vitamin D deficiency in November, but having you know, vitamin, been replete with vitamin D, there was clear evidence of elevated parathyroid hormone. And perhaps even more importantly, she had symptomatic and asymptomatic kidney stones. So we felt on that basis, it was reasonable to offer her a parathyroidectomy. So we did that. And on histopatholo histopathology, she did indeed have a right, a right, a right uh, parathyroid hormone. And I think what this case, uh, there's an echo. What this case illustrates quite nicely and why it's quite important to, to bear in mind is you can have normal calcemic hyperparathyroidism with vitamin D deficiency. So vitamin D deficiency is very, 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 very common. So you'll, you'll see much more vitamin D deficiency than you will see primary hyperparathyroidism. But it's important to remember that the two can coexist. And it's important to also make sure that in anybody, who, unless it's a clear cut case of hyperparathyroidism. So if someone has hypercalcemia, an elevated PTH, you're pretty safe in making the diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism. But if they're normal calcemic, you have got to make sure that vitamin D normalizes before you can say with, a, with any degree of confidence that this is indeed primary hyperparathyroidism. Thank you. Superb. Thank you kindly. I think we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, there are some questions that I didn't quite get to, but um, Johan, I think uh, if you like, you can bring us home. Yeah, thank you, Mark. I think um, this was really um, um, a, a very um, thorough um, topic discussed in a very short time. Um, I think from my side, I, I just want to hear if there's any comments from Prof. Shaha, from Alan, or from uh, uh, Florette. Um, I want to thank each and everyone tonight, really, for all the time and effort putting in here, Prof, especially for you. Um, I mean, we enjoyed you. We enjoyed your comments. We definitely want to see you again on a webinar or on a on a congress. But can I ask maybe just one or two comments from uh, from uh, from the from the uh, um, the faculty, and then we can end off the the webinar. Mm. Prof, we can't hear you. Okay, um, it was accidental, so sorry for that. So, but but the parathyroid surgery is a very interesting surgery, and the you know you do any abdominal surgery. What happens to the patient next day? Nobody knows. You are the only one who knows. But the parathyroid, when the calcium does not come down next day, the family knows you failed. The proof of the pudding is: Did my calcium come down? Did my parathyroid hormone come down? And it does not happen in 5% of the patient. Those are the patients where we, who are very difficult to manage in long run. And then you go back to your endocrinologist. Was there an indication to operate? Another thing is, if this is a disease not going to hurt the patient in few months, few weeks, or even year. In a VA hospital, the average time is about 8 to 10 years before they come to surgery. So you've got ample time. Don't be in a rush like thyroid cancer that they need it to be operated tomorrow. Get all your acts together. Get the investigation. And sometimes one blood test is not enough. Repeat it. Maybe in two months, three months, maybe another lab. Uh, and make sure if you're going to follow the parathyroid hormone in one lab, follow with the same lab. And if you have the uh, good localization study, you know, there was a statement made by John Dopman, who used to be a radiologist at NIH. He made a comment in 1986. The best localization study for parathyroid surgery is to localize a good parathyroid surgeon. And I think that statement has gone in every parathyroid lecture. And I think that is the message. You have, have, you have to have a parathyroid armamentarium with everybody around. And you need to talk to each other. You need to develop a relation, parathyroid relation, I call it, or a parathyroid family. And then your success rate will be as high as 98, 99%. Thank you so much, Prof. Shah. Really, really appreciate it. Um, any other comments for anyone else? 
There's no the more only thing, I, the only thing I will say, I've said it before and I'll say it again. The, the diagnosis is a biochemical diagnosis. That's if you take away nothing from what I've said, take away that. Thank you, Alicia. Lorette, anything from your side, Alan? Lorette? Nothing. No, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Anna. I really appreciate you putting together this meeting and all your effort. And um, I think from my side, parathyroid surgery is rewarding and it, and it really can be the most um, rewarding and you know pleasing experience. But on the other hand, when you don't find it the most crushingly, despairingly um, difficult surgery where you're just not successful. Um, that's just from a personal point of view. But Johan, thanks again very much for this meeting. No, thank you to you, Alan. Thanks for all your effort as well. I really, really appreciate it. And everyone's time. I want to end off to thank Medtronic. And, um, and I also want to just quickly, just a reminder, the last webinar for this year. I know um, it's maybe almost like we say in South Africa, it's a last minute try. But I think it's um, going to be quite an exciting uh, webinar as well, brought it. Um, that's um, obviously uh, at least in uh, head and neck. It's most probably the, the surgery with the highest litigation. So I think it's going to be an exciting one. And we're going to have an international speaker, Prof. James O'Neill, that we're all looking forward to. And yeah, thanks for everyone. Uh, Mark, thanks for everything. Thanks for all the support from the IT. And uh, yeah, take care of yourself. Wear your masks when needed. And uh, sleep tight. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's just wait for everybody to go off the call. Actually, I just remembered I didn't do what I did last time. We uh, answered some of those questions um, at the end, uh, just gave people the opportunity to uh, get their questions answered. Never well, mind. I did ask um, if those questions are available in a sort of a report. So, yes, those um, the questions that the audience did post it in the chat box. Um, will be available and I think um, just to close that learning loop if we can we can use it as um, post on social media just to answer some of those questions that um, were not addressed in during the webinar okay but Mark I do think you answered all the questions quite good and I was yeah I thought you covered it what, what did we miss do you think we missed a few questions um, I think maybe three. Well, maybe two of them were comments, actually. There was one question about methylene blue. Oh, yes. And, I see. Um, and then there was another question or well, comment from Etienne Myberg about um, radio guided parathyroidic parathyroidectomy. Oh, yeah, I saw those two. Sorry, you were right. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. But I think you still managed to. Um, yeah, pretty much covered most of them. So I'm not, I'm not stressed. Yeah, well done. Well done. Um, Mark, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Ilza and um, all the IT support. Yeah, we appreciate it. And uh, yeah, um, Mark, it's two Marks here tonight now. So Mark and Mark. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it, Mark. And uh, Nicoline, Ilza, I'm going to say goodbye. Sleep tight, you guys. And thanks yeah, for everything. Well done, everybody. Thanks, guys. Well, thanks very much. Well done, everybody. Good one. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Bye -bye. Nicoline, thanks. Well done. Great work, Nicolene. You're welcome, Mark. Always a pleasure.
speak tomorrow. I'm going to go to sleepies now. <laughs> right, off you go. I'll see you tomorrow. You can sleep in. I won't phone you at eight, all right? <laughs> all right, I'll be here. Uh, I'll, I'll give you till nine, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you kindly. <laughs> Do you